Okay, so welcome again to the penultimate plenary for this internship stream. I'm glad at least that you know, we have quite a number of us uh, getting to this stage of the plenary. Um, I mean, it's, it's always a, an experience, you know, starting with what you would call unknown entities. And then as, you know, as we progress in the journey, many start to fall out, fall away, and then some names start to become noticeable and then notable to you. And you know, that's why I know, uh, you know we can start, start to know one another on first names, second name basis. Because before, you know, everybody came like, how I many of us would be like 20 something, 30 something, but you know, I mean, everybody talked, oh, this is what I am and this is what I would like to be or what I would like to do. But you know, just like life is, we all started on the same line, but we all don't get to the finish line at the same time or even at all. So some get there, some don't get there. So I'm glad that I mean, it's for those of you who are hitting this penultimate as the second to the final plenary session that we are having today. And um, what we're talking about today is a topic I titled the technicalities of a successful career and business. The technicalities of a successful career and business. Now, um, I bracketed writing because in this context, the context of this internship, what we are looking at really is, we are looking at our writing, editorial, communication uh, skills, how to enhance them, how to improve them how to, I mean, become better. And these are hard calls that make for a sustainable success. Now, every, well, maybe most people or some people hit moment of success at certain times. If you were part of Drive uh, last Sunday, we talked about, um, we talked about moments, moments of those experience as propounded by Abraham Maslow when even somebody can actually experience those heights of the pyramid of success of being, of becoming. So all of us, we have uh, successes at different points in, in time, but it's not all successes that we in, I mean, experience that are sustainable, that last long. So we are looking at what are those costs that make for a sustainable success that make the success that we are enjoying in our career, in our business, to be a long-lasting one. Even when you are successful, even when you are thriving, you are doing well, there will always be periods and moments of challenges. There will always be times, I mean, downtime, when uh, things don't seem to be working the way you want them. But that doesn't mean the person is not a success. It doesn't mean that the, the system is not a success. So it's how you also manage those downtimes, those downturns, those low moments that actually help to determine how, how long the, your success, success will be sustained. And now we are looking at technicalities. What are the technical stuff? What are the hard cores that we need to know to make our career a sustainable uh, success? In whatever we uh, so today we'll be talking about this very important um, uh, an overview personal application skill acquisition structure system customer acquisition customer retention talent acquisition talent retention and then cash flow we are talking about art costs this list is not exhaustive there are more but these are what we'll be looking at today. And to go to the first one, which is personal application, every success has a mix, a personal mix to them. Every success. So there's usually that X factor, that personal factor that makes for success. How do you apply yourself? Now, the truth is that not everybody applies him or herself the same way. Some are more disciplined than others. Some are more intense than others. 
Some are more detailed than others. Some are more resourceful than others. Some are more organized than others. All these personal attributes, personal, not even attributes, we we'll call them attributes, all those personal um, uh, application of the self, because, I mean, all of us are not born with self-discipline. All of us are not born with organizational skills. So those are things that we add or we get added to ourselves as we evolve. So what are you, what have you applied yourself to? In what area are you applying yourself in terms of to be a better professional, to be a better person in your place of work, in your duties, in your responsibilities? What are your personal application? Am I the kind of person that is applying myself to be more diligent in terms of how I work so that I can, I can work for longer time or I can work even the same time but get more done, which is what productivity means. I'm spending the same time, but now I'm producing more. I'm getting more done. I'm taking off more number. I'm chunking the number from my list. Yet, why is still working the same time that I've always worked? Personal application. So we just they will just do the basic minimum, and then that is all. But those that go that extra mile, you see that they tend to be more successful than others. Now, you may not look as if they are being successful, but you know, everything we do is a seed. And it's going to speak for itself at a certain point in, in time. It's going, to, it's going to result in some kind of harvest. Then skill acquisition. What, what do you have in your tool, in, the, in your in your skit tool? Or in your in your in your skill repository? What if if we open if there's a bag that contains the skill you have as a person? If we open that bag now, how many skills will, will we see there? You have to learn to acquire the right skills that you need for success. Once you have determined now, nobody can determine what success means for you. It's a personal matter. But once you have decided on what success means for you, you should also know what are the skill sets you need that will get you there or that will deliver it to you. So when we open your bag of skills, what are we going to see there? If success to me as a writer means that I have I've published, I publish uh, maybe 30 books, for instance. If, and I said, this, this is what success means to me. And I want, and somebody opens my skill bag, would they see writing skill as part of my of my of my skill set? Would they see creative writing skill? Because even writing skill, I mean, as a zone, I mean variety. Would they see creative writing skill, which is what actually keeps the readers engaged? Would they see editorial prowess as part of my skills? Would they see time management? Because you can never, never be able to do a book without having this discipline of time management. Would they see time management as part of the skills I have? Would they see? Um, would they see? Um, maybe publishing skill would be the basic of um, uh, Office to using Microsoft Office uh, application to actually type my, my writing, to type my manuscript. Would they see all those? You've got to know what are the skills requirement for your success, for your desired success, and you've got to start acquiring them if you do not have them already. If you do not have them, you've got to know. And no, I'm actually glad because at least based on what I've read from you guys' profiles, I can talk to Azubi K. Azubi K is already uh, a security expert here. He already has, I mean, he's already made a name for himself in the security field. But Azubi K also wants to, I mean, I know maybe you've done like one or two books. Now you want to, you know, you want to take that further because books actually give you credibility as an expert in your field. A professor can never be named professor unless 
he or she has published several journals, several, several articles, research articles in journals. So th that is to tell you the importance of writing in career success. So as we can now, is this time, I want to also improve my writing skills so I can do more books on security, so I can be able to even do books that, be, that will become a bestseller. So that is a commendable move on your part because you're probably busy, have other things that you are actually trying to attend to, but the fact that you are taking these extra steps and no, many of the people that even, that, that's what one of the I also have noticed, many of those that actually last long are the ones that are even the busiest ones in the internship. Many of those that just jump out are those ones that don't really, they don't really have much things they are doing. But because they don't have that discipline on knowing, okay, this is what I need to do. I need to do this. I need to apply myself to do this. They fall out when, there's, when they are they are being challenged to do more than they are used to doing. Or maybe for Marianne, because from what I read of your profile, you manage projects, you do this and all that with your communication background. Yet you are still, okay, I need to learn more. I need to know more so I can do more in what I'm doing. I can be a better project manager with a better career, I mean, with a, an improved writing skills. So that speaks to your skill acquisition. What are the things in your bag when we open it? What skills will be shown there? So you've got to know the right skills you need for success and you've got to start acquiring them, pay for them, buy them. Pay, you can pay like this one, Look, none of you guys is paying, but you are paying with your time. You are paying with your data. You are paying with your discipline of sticking, sticking to it. So you've got to pay for them. You've got to buy them. So I know because it's not, some of us think maybe payment is because I don't have to drop 10,000, 20,000 for, for the training. And that's why it's easy for people to just fall out. They don't know that what, I mean, they are, the payment is just really for the time. The discipline does take to stay true. Those are payments. But not everybody see it that way. Then another thing is structure. When you're not talking in terms of, I want to pursue writing as a business. What is the kind of structure I need? What is structure? You know, one of the reasons why the Red Writer has, has stayed so long is that only we are the first um, writing and editorial business in West Africa, if not in Africa itself, that has lasted this long. <laughs> Many people, and we've trained many people, people come, they work for us for some time, they go to start on their own, but you know, they struggle because of structure. It's one thing to have talent. It's another thing to have the discipline of structure. They are two different things. Was it yesterday, some days I was talking to those in the apprenticeship about a phenomenon that every savvy um, employer of labor knows that if you want to, if you want to, I mean, I mean, for as you as a, if you want to acquire skills or talent or, or um, um, maybe any skill, it's easy. Once you have the right price, you can buy any, you can buy any skill, you can buy any any talent, you can buy anything. There's nothing that we don't have that you can purchase now. Any skill, no matter how complex it is, that you can purchase in this gig gig world, gig economy. But you cannot buy attitude. Attitude is more expensive to buy than skills and talent. So you've got to know. I have the, I have this skill. I have this skill. Do I have the structure to make this skill uh, commercial? I mean, com commercialized to turn it into a money making venture to turn it into something that is that is not just making money, but able to also last a long haul. Structure is very important. Structure is what keeps an entity to be sustainable. If you remember, I think one of the twelve sessions we had, we're talking about this same thing, structure, the framework, how it helps you to stay, how it helps you to, to, to last. It gives you stamina, it gives you stability. What is the structure around your, around your skills? to make it a commercial entity, to make it something that would deliver the goods to you. So you've got to think about that. You've got to work on that. Structure, the framework, the processes. How, how would I start? 
What will I do at point A? What will I do at point B? What will I do at point C? And how does it go round and round and round and round? And you know, that is why if you should see a company that lasts long or that is sustainable, is this structure is very important. People, human beings are just, they will come, they will go. But once a structure that is holding that corporation stays the same, they don't tweak, they don't change the structure, you will see that it will last, if it outlast, if it will even last long, even where people are coming and they are moving out. This is the ship that will be doing it for how many streams, how many sets now? This is the fifth set. People come, people go, but the structure remains the same and it's just even, it's given getting better. We are improving on it every time we improve on it. The structure that keeps the, I mean, the organization or the system going. And when people come, when people join you, once they know the structure, then they just walk within that structure. They keep that structure going. It's people that run the structure. The systems, and I think maybe I talked about when I was talking about, about structure. System speaks to your procedures, your processes. How do you get things done from point A to point B to point C to point D to point Z? What are the things you need to do? What are the the, what 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 is the frequency of those things that need to be done? Is it once? Is it twice? Is it thrice? Or is it? I mean, is it a cyclical something that some, it goes back to, or is something that is progressive in nature? It moves in in, in uh, is it cyclical or is 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 just a flat line? It goes to a flat line system. You've got to determine the system that works for what you are offering, that works for your skills, that works for your talent, that works for your, for your business. If you want to make your writing or editorial skills as a form of business, and then you stick to that, you work with that. Because ap after your structure, your system is what now gets you going. Gets you going, it, it gets you focused. You know, okay, if there are even issues, you can easily trace them to where there was the issue started from because you have a system in place to know okay at this point a has done his own b has done his own c has done his own is at the point of c that he didn't get to e this is where the issue is so you don't have to start uh probably with a and b but you just have to look at what are the things that were wrong that c did not do well that didn't allow this thing to get to d or that allow this thing to get to D, but it got to D in a deformed way. So these are things that systems help you to do. Then customer acquisition. Now I, I have this, my systems defined, I need to start acquiring customer because I didn't just go through all this stress, all this uh, burning this data, my, my time and all that, just for the fun of it. I'm looking at improving my revenue, improving my income through this. So what do I need to do to acquire a customer? You've got to have marketing skills. You've got to have um, marketing strategy that, that you are going to use to acquire customers to come and patronize your business, to come and patronize your service if you are doing it as a gig. I want to offer, I mean, security consulting for people. How am I going to get customers? What do I need to do? So that, those are the things that will help your business to succeed, your practice to succeed. And how many customers can I comfortably manage in a month, in a week, so that I don't also get too much than I'm able to, to handle. And then I'll get to start to get deflated or discouraged or even overwhelmed. So what are my customer acquisition strategy? What do I have in place? to be able to acquire customers and to keep them coming in on a regular basis. Then what strategy do I have in place to retain customers when they come? Am I a one-time one customer service or practice or business that once the customer comes and uh, I mean, I've given them the service they want, they are not happy, they don't come back again. How am I going to retain them? What are my strategy to for retaining my customers through excellent service delivery, through excellent customer service culture, 
Where I call them to know how, how did you find my service? How did you find what I've done for you? How did you find the writing? How did you find the editing? Do you like them? Or is there something you think I should have done better? Do you have that strategy in place to retain customers? Or I, I just want to run my blog. What, what strategy do I have to keep my customers to always visit my blog? Do I run promo? Do I give them some rewards to be able to, for them to come? Do I send newsletters to them to, so that they, because they, they don't have to be thinking about my, my blog or my site all the time. But what do I do to keep my site in their face so that they can see it? Oh, let me go and see what uh, this my friend has written again. What insight, what, what new uh, knowledge he or, he or she is willing to share with us? What, do you, what strategy do you have in place to retain customers? To retain your readers? Then talent acquisition. There will be a point in time that you will need to start to engage people to work with you or for you or to employ them to work for your engagement. That will be short term, uh, maybe per project basis or employment. That will be like a, a more, uh, uh, how do I call it, a more permanent, um, I mean, employment basis where you just put them on salary. What strategy do you have in place to be able to acquire talent? Do you just employ people because they say they need jobs? Or you are acquiring the persons who have skills that are relevant to your practice, to your business, to your venture, that maybe they have skills in areas that you are deficient in. And you are willing to be able to pay them so that they can work with you and you know, and they will feel, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm making a difference. So you have to look for somebody who has a who has a comment, I mean, a co commensurable skill in areas you are lacking. In areas that you are lacking. See, um, I mean, myself, for instance, I, I know I have many things I'm, I'm doing that. I, so it's easy for me to actually get lost in maybe. Uh, practice some of the things I need to do. And that's why somebody like Mary is, is a very valuable asset to me as a person right? because she just helps me to organize some of this. Honestly, for this meeting, I don't forgotten. I was thinking more about my MIT class. I need to attend at 8 o'clock here in Nigerian time, sorry, UK time. And I mean, that, that would have been 2 p.m. in in US where I came from. So that's what I was I was thinking about. But then also, we say, ah, that is, oh, I think, geez, I have this plan, I have forgotten about it. So you need people. Now, um, I, I, I do the writing, I do the, maybe the management, but maybe, maybe do, does the management of the processes, of the, the reminder, the mobilization. So I don't have to worry myself about that. So you've got to, at, at some point, you will need maybe to have talent joining you, it may not be in the area of your, your, your core delivery, but I mean, in a way that can complement what you do. And you've got to know how to source those talent. Where will you get them? How will you get them? How will you engage them to work with you, either full time, part time, or short term basis, a project basis? So you've got to know, and I always say something, I say, you are not in business until you started to deal with staffing issues. You are not in business. Nobody's in business or decide, it's in this gig economy where I run my gig, I do this thing. But you start to handle, manage staff. You are not in business because as I said earlier, when we started, humans, we are the, we are the best creature of God. We are also the worst creature of God. So everybody comes to the workplace with baggages of assets and also liabilities. People have challenges. People have so very legitimate challenges. You can't fault them for having challenges. You can't fault them for having expectations about how, I mean, the workplace should be, the kind of work they will need to do. But, you know, you have to, you, you can only fault yourself for not managing those. If you don't manage them well, then you know, it will continue to affect you. So until you start to manage staff, we are not in business yet. So how do you even acquire them? How do you now retain them when they come? How do you retain them when they come? Now it could be from your side. I mean, because there's nobody you know they said uh, in the world of business, 
the customer is always right. That is as far as it goes. In the world of business, the boss is not always right. The staff are not always right, even though both, both can be seen, oh, I'm right, everybody will be thinking they are right in their own. But how do you manage those dynamics? How do you know, okay, this is an area, I'm falling short as a, as a, as a talent acquirer and as somebody was a talent manager. I'm, this is where I'm falling short. This is where the staff or the, uh, the person I'm engaging needs to also brace up. And then you're able to have difficult conversations when things are not aligning the way you want them. Difficult conversations. Most of us don't like confrontation, that's the truth. But you cannot ret even retain, if you, you retain people and they are not giving you what you want, you'll be feeling frustrated, they'll be feeling frustrated because both of you are not getting what you want. But for you to even be talking of sensible retainment, I mean retention, you've got to be able to have very frank and difficult conversations. You tell them where they are not doing so well, they tell you where they think you can also improve. Talent retention. So it's wanting to acquire the talent, it's order to also retain the talent. And if you feel, hey, maybe this long-term thing is not good, and maybe you keep get bound. And that is one, one of the things that an average employer has to, unless maybe we are a multi, whatever. Once you are a small scale, small medium scale uh, enterprise, you are bound to have staffing issues. There is no, there is no um, avoiding it. Once you start to talk, employing people on a more permanent basis, it's bound to come. That's where, that's where it even shows how good you are at managing the whole system. When somebody goes, how does it affect your operations? Does your operation collapse on the back of somebody leaving? That means you didn't get your structure right. That means you didn't get your systems right. That means you didn't get your, your system right. That means your, your structure wasn't right. Because that means you've built, you've built your structure and your system around somebody, which is not good. You should not be around yourself. Because if you are not there, what happens? We we'll we'll, we'll also keep running. So this, this, the human beings are made to run the system, run the, run the structure. Not, not bear them, not, not, not bear them as a burden. So we need to note that there's, there's, this, there's this difference between acquiring talent, retaining talent, and maintaining the system and the structure, even with talent having, a talent can have an off day, and there's nothing you can do about that. So how do you still deliver to your customers, to your readers, to your audience, without them noticing that there's something that missed from your back end? Cash flow. Now, when we've, we are retaining talent, we are, we are doing all this, and we've acquired customers, cash will start to flow. When cash flows in, how do you manage your cash flow? How do you do it? Do you, oh, I have this need, do you just spend all the cash you have on your need, on your personal needs? Or you have a budgeting system to help you to organize your spending? Do you know what are the, the recurrent bills you have on a monthly basis? And yes, once you are in business, you start to pay bills. Either you make customers, you have customers coming in after you make money or you don't make money, you start to pay. There are certain bills you have to pay. Once you have an inter, you have a website, I, the website doesn't know maybe you, you have customers, you don't have customers, you have to renew your domain name, you have to renew your domain, I mean, your domain hosting, you have to renew domain name, domain hosting, you have to, I mean, pay whoever, whoever is managing your site for you if you're not the one managing it. They don't need to know that you are not making money. So how do you manage your cash flow to take care of all those bills? There are taxes to pay, there are bills to pay. How do you manage all those? So when money comes, and you and no business is also business, money will not come like every day. Yeah, if it's coming every day, you have product that is good and people are buying fantastic for you. But you have to still manage your cash flow because once it's coming every day, that means you also have bills to pay every day. That somebody who's not making it every day, you know they, they don't pay like you. So you have to this cash flow. That's why you hear that in the whole world is the is the global statistics. 90, they say 98% of businesses die in the second year of business. 
two years, global statistics, two years, give them two years, they are gone. Cash flow. Cash flow. That's what makes the difference. So how do you manage cash flow? How do you, when the, when the money is coming in, how do you manage it? When it's going out, how do you manage it? How do you stay liquid for the next bill that you're going to pay? Do you even know what the next bill is? Do you have a budget system in place to, to give you, I'm going to pay this bill, this rent is due uh, next month, this one is due next month. You know, it's in it's in Nigeria, I don't know, maybe other parts of um, other parts of Africa that you pay rent in, uh, in, in, on, in an annual basis. In in other other way, even in Kenya, because I mean I had some Kenya uh, business associates and I've gone to Kenya for a training for like two weeks or so. And you know, the parents every every month go to US, go to UK, go to everywhere. The parents in monthly installments. It's not an annual thing. So how do you pay the next rent that is due the next month, that is due the next month? So how do you manage cash flow to be able to pay your bills? Even if you are paying it in annual installment, are you saving up for the next rent? Or you are going to, people that you, you beg to give you money to start the business, this is going to start begging them to pay to help you pay your next rent. That is not acceptable. Because you're supposed to save money to finance the business. No, um, I have a friend who reached out to me some, some months ago, I know a good friend, and we're talking, and he said, okay, uh, okay, that he, need, he needed me to assist him with money to, I'm using this as an example, to use him that, that his car that he uses for Uber has been bad, he needs to replace the engine, he needs to do this, he needs to do that. I say, have you, have you been using this car? He said, have you been using it? So what have you been doing with the money that you are working from the car? And he said, you're missing family needs. And I say, see, I'm talking to you as a friend. Don't go and start saying this to people because those people we are talking to, they probably have better financial discipline than you are. That's why you can talk to them because people that have money more is because they have some level of more discipline in terms of managing money. That's why they do. Most of us, if you look at what comes to us, it'd be basically the same thing or the same proportion. It's just how we, how we spend money. I say, if you go and talk to, the first thing they will ask you is that, if you are using this car for Uber business, for how many years? What have you saved to ensure that you are even servicing the engine, you are maintaining the engine, or you replace the engine? The car should be able to generate the money, income to pay his own bill. Not that you go and beg people, beg people to give you money to buy a car, you beg people to give you money to maintain the car. It's not done. And that's the way some of us think. Yeah, I will, once I, I talk to them, they, and, but thankfully we have um, a work from home, this gig economy, work from home. You can beg people to give you money to start the business. You can now start begging people to give you money to run the business. It doesn't make sense. People that are savvy financially will just look at you, they will just shuffle. They won't give you. Because it's, what is true, if they give you the money, they say you still come and beg them again for the same thing. So you've got to know how to manage your cash flow where the money is coming. Ah, thanks, thanks for listening. This, there is this shot. Uh, thanks for listening. Do we have any questions, please? Questions, questions, questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, Thank please. you so much. Yeah. Most <laughs> I really love the topic I'm um, talking My curiosity here is um, you know, it's something that we often time talk about managing people. Mm. Yeah. I've been managing them for let me say for the past uh, 10 years now. I work in a team, often time I lead the team, make some time, make my dialogue with the senior level. So I'm I I must agree with you that uh, we actually the best of the story. So is there is there any um any um specific um Food that you can. I like to ask you how to get the best out of food in the same setting. Like that. So I didn't get the question. Sorry, as I know that you said that for the past ten years we've been managing teams, we've been working with teams, but yeah, I didn't get the question. So I feel like I'm not actually able to manage people. Yes, it's not. <laughs> I, I agree with you on the percentage. Yeah, best and the worst. Mm -hmm. The question is, 
I took tips. I don't need tips that you can give us, you can share with us on how to bring out the best out of um, people that we need or those that we intend to live. Now, you know, uh, thanks for that question. That is, that's a question that I'm sure virtually every employer, every team lead is always thinking about how do I manage people? How do I get the best out of them? Now, one of one of my own quotes is that, you know, excellence is an attitude. It's not something that, uh, an attitude is not something that, um, I mean, somebody you get trained for. It's just part of you. So when you, for you to even talk of managing people, you have to know how do you even get the, the, the right person or the right people to join your team. And just like I started with, you don't look much at the talent. Yeah, the skills are good because that's what you need to do the work. But much more than the skills, you need the attitude. Attitudes are far more expensive and, more co and costlier to acquire than skills. So you've got to, does this person have the right spirit, the right attitude for work? They can be skilled and not have the discipline to do the work. And you know, uh, because you no, know, another we have a new generation of uh, workers in the, in the in the workplace. Who I mean, if you we have more millennials in the workplace, and if you read more about millennials and all that, money millennials, you see that there are issues around engaging millennials, and particularly if you are small and medium scale uh, businesses. Not, not like the the big, the Google, the Apple. I mean, those ones that you just have, they have very fantastic or robust structure where you just float, flow in and then you, you do your work and all that. But in terms of small and medium accelerator crisis, there are issues you need to grapple with. What are the things they want? Are you willing to give those? Are you willing, are you able to give them what they want? Are you able to give them the kind of, uh, maybe the, remuneration they, they want, the kind of uh, validation they want, the kind of even uh, the feedback as well, because feedback is part of managing people. And this, these are kind of people we give feedback to the next thing, they coil in and they react. So you've got to know, this person I'm dealing with, what is the, I mean, what age, um, would be the, uh, the age bracket and all that, the, the generation, and how do I mean those generations? How do they typically react to to rebuke, to 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 uh, to feedback? So, feedback is part of it. How do you motivate them? What are the things that matter to them? Some money. Some maybe they want you to be. Uh, everybody, you give them. Oh, you are doing fantastic. Can you give them? And no, they are fine. Some they want something. Maybe they want. Some want stretch assignments, something that will stretch them. Some don't even want to stretch themselves. So if you know this person doesn't want to stretch him or herself, that means, and you, you are operating in the, in the field that you need to continually to outdo yourself, that means you don't have the right person working on your team. Because the person would continue to murmur and lament. And the thing with when having people with bad attitude on board is that Bad attitude is like cancer. It starts to eat into not just the person, you also eat into the peace and the stability of the other members of the team. Because you only have one person, once a once person once start, to, start to complain, start to murmur, it affects the others. Others to start to murmur, they start to complain, start to look at you as uh, you are just asking us to work, work, work. What are you even doing, self? So you've got to know the attitude matters more than the skills because you can always get the skills. And if somebody have the right attitude, they would they would develop the skills that they need. You can always acquire skills. Attitude is not so easy to acquire. So you manage them by actually choosing who you even get in. The, is this person manageable? I feel okay. This person is not going to be manageable, but I need the person for a certain project, and I have maybe like if a time frame in mind what I need this person to deliver on this project. Can I? Can I just tolerate this person for this period when I need this thing to be done? That's also a strategy you have to adopt. 
Maybe you don't have any of your current teammates who have that skill, but you need to get somebody. I don't want, I mean, it's not maybe, you know, you, uh, this person will not be able to last long on this, but you have some projects you need to get done. Like, let me get this person on board and let this person come and do this work for me. And, you know, this person will likely go because of the way, I mean, you've seen maybe during the interview, during the initial stages of engagement, this person will not last, but I need to manage this person to give me the best that I need for this period of time. How do you manage that? Six months, three months, 12 months. Those are the things you need to also know. So, I mean, it's a, a, a bit of a mixture of many things, the strategy you adopt in even the shortlisting, the how you go about engaging them, managing them, talking to them, uh, chastising them. Please, I don't, uh, me, I'm very quick to praise and I'm also quick to chastise. I don't, I don't hold back. So if somebody is doing something right, let them know. Commend it immediately and let everybody know you are commending them. And one person not do something right, let them know as well. Because if you don't give feedback, you are mismanaging your staff. You are mismanaging your team members. You've got to give feedback. Now, they don't have to take the feedback in good faith. But it's your own responsibility as a manager to give the feedback. It's your responsibility to give it. And if they have issues, they will let you know, and then you can sort it out. But you have to give feedback. You have to lead by communicating, by engaging with them. Not just in silos. As we are giving you the work, you know what to do. Don't be, no, you can't do it that way. I hope that answers your question some part. I, I truly hope so. Uh, as you, if you have any other questions, please. Yes, I'm very well. I'm very Thank well. you. Thank you so much. Any other question, please? Any other question as we bring the session to a close? Okay, I want to say thanks for coming. Thanks for joining the um, session today. We'll see tomorrow for the very final one. We'll be talking about the subtleties of career and business success. Um, today we we'll talked about the technicalities. These are actually hard calls. Tomorrow we'll look at, we'll look at the soft calls, the subtleties. Those sort of things that they won't teach you in business school, they won't teach you, nobody will sit you down be telling you this in business school that you must do this, you must do that. But those are very subtle, but they also contribute to career success or business success. And those are what we look tomorrow to round off this session. So thanks again for coming. See, we see tomorrow, same time. Have a fantastic evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.